Well, let's get started. Thank you, everyone, for coming over to the law school. I see some new faces, and um, welcome. Thank you for making your way over here and spending your lunch time with us. My name is Chris Cervanic. I'm the Associate Director at the Center for Civil and Human Rights. And um, I am going to circulate a sign-up sheet. For those of you who don't get our email messages or, or haven't, have, don't know what the Center is up to, um, if you give us your name and email, we'll get you on our mailing list so that you can um, know in advance of all the events that we have planned for this year. So it is my pleasure to um, give the first welcome to Martina Vandenberg. She's with the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center and has agreed to give this talk to us today on um, the Human Rights uh, Human Trafficking Report Card. Um, but I am not going to give the full introduction. Um, I introduce to you Alexa Professor Alexandra Levy, who is at, here at the law school, and she is our in-house expert on human trafficking and works very closely as a very close colleague of Martina. So it's thanks to Alex that Martina is here today, and um, I'll turn the microphone over to Alex for the full introduction of Martina. Hi, I'm Alex Levy. Um, Thank you to Martina for coming all the way from DC. Thank you also to CCHR for hosting her so generously. Um, so it's my, I'm honored to work with Martina and have worked with her for two years. Uh, Martina spent about two decades fighting human trafficking. Um, she has fought on behalf of many victims and fought traffickers of many varieties, including notably very powerful diplomats. Um, Martina is widely regarded as an expert on an array of human rights issues. She's testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee on Human Rights, the Holinsky Commission, House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Armed Services Committee. Um, Martina used to be a human rights watch researcher and in that capacity spearheaded investigations into human rights violations in the Russian Federation um, and many other places including Israel and Ukraine. She authored the first published report documenting human trafficking in Israel. Uh, she's also the author of two Human Rights Watch reports. And while living in the Russian Federation, uh, she co-founded Shostri, which was uh, one of Russia's first rape crisis centers for women. Uh, uh, Martina established uh, the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center in 2012 with help from the o Open Society Foundations. Before that, she was a partner at Jenner and Block, um, where she focused on complex commercial litigation and uh, internal investigations under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, at Jenner, she received the very prestigious uh, Albert E. Jenner Jr. Pro Bono Award for her successful representation of trafficking victims in United States federal courts, as well as for her advocacy before Congress. Uh, I can say, having worked with Martina for two years um, and having known of her for significantly longer than that, that there is really no one I would rather have on my side in court or fighting for my rights. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Alex, for that very generous introduction. It's an honor to be here at Notre Dame Law School. I'm delighted. Thank you to CCHR and to Chris for hosting me. One of the best pieces of advice that I got from one of my partners at the law firm when I was representing a trafficking victim in a civil case was go into the negotiations and behave like a zealot, right? Then the defense counsel will think that you're a zealot and you're crazy and they'll give you a better settlement. So now I am a confirmed anti-trafficking zealot. I took his advice. And I hope at the end of our short time together today that you too will be anti-trafficking zealots. It's wonderful to see a room full of human rights lawyers and people who are so interested in trafficking. I so loved the poster that you made. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Al. Oh, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> and thank you, uh, thank you, Chris and Sister Anne, for all the preparation work you did for today. Um, I, I respect in, um, enormously the work that you've already done. I love the poster so much that I made it my title slide. And as advertised, what I want to talk about today 
is essentially a human trafficking report card. We're used to thinking about human trafficking as an international issue, something that happens far, far away in Thailand, but no. There are a lot of report cards. The report card that you see on the right side, the trafficking in persons report, report card, is the United States' report card of every country around the world. Every other country, right? We report on everyone. We rank every country in the, in the world as tier one, which means you're doing great, you're getting an A. Tier two, you're trying, but you're kind of falling down on the job. Tier two watch list, which is you are falling off the cliff and you really need to shape up. And tier three, which means you're not doing anything to fight trafficking and we're going to slap sanctions on you, supposedly. Now, the Department of Justice Attorney General's annual report to Congress is the equivalent of the TIP report, the State Department's report, but it's the report on the United States. It's the report to Congress on the United States. The United States has actually only included itself in the State Department's trafficking report since Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State, so not very long. And it will not shock you to know that the United States gives itself an A every year. <laughs> so what I'm here to ask is the question of really do we deserve that? Do we deserve Tier 1? Do we deserve the A? Now, the countries, including the United States, are judged on what originally were called the three <coughs> Ps. It's now become the four Ps. But the only letter in the alphabet you really need to know is P. So the first one is prosecution. The, section, the second is protection. And the third is prevention. Now, the smaller little baby P is partnership. So we'll talk about that later. So let's start with prosecution. You could be forgiven if you read the New York Times or the Washington Post or the local papers, you could be forgiven because they get so much play in the paper for thinking that all that the U.S. state government is doing is prosecuting trafficking cases. But you would be wrong because the numbers are actually quite pathetically small. So in 2012, there were 128 federal trafficking cases prosecuted. That includes all kinds of trafficking, trafficking for forced labor, Trafficking of adults for forced prostitution, that is prostitution <coughs> that is achieved through forced fraud or coercion. It also includes the commercial sexual exploitation of children, where there's no forced fraud or coercion required. You just have to induce a child to commit a commercial sex act, and you have trafficked the child. 128 cases in the entire country at the federal level in 2012, only 161 in 2013. Those are very small numbers. And if you dig a little bit deeper and you look at what's actually being prosecuted, if you look for 2011, the year before, the total is only 125 cases, of which 101 cases are sex and 24 cases are labor. Those of us who've worked in the trafficking field for a very long time know that on the ground, when we look around, actually we believe that the number of forced labor cases in the United States is higher than the number of forced prostitution and child commercial sexual exploitation cases. So the prosecutions, even the ones that we do see, don't reflect the reality that the non-governmental organizations see on the ground. So let's move on to protection. What's the United States doing in the protection area? For foreign-born victims, it is very difficult to cooperate with law enforcement unless you have some kind of status. So in all of the trafficking victims I've represented in the years of doing litigation on behalf of trafficking victims, all of my foreign-born clients came to the United States legally. It's a myth that people are sneaking across the border and then finding themselves in trafficking situations. It happens. But more often than not, my clients come on special visas to work as domestic workers, or they come on special visas to work in agriculture. When they leave their employer, that special visa ends and they are undocumented. Because the visa is tied to the employer, it makes it much easier for the employer to exploit them because the moment they walk out the front door, they're out of status and undocumented and vulnerable. So what the federal government decided to do when the Trafficking Victims Protection Act passed in 2000 was they decided to create something called continued presence, which in theory is a brilliant idea where you give someone essentially temporary immigration status and a work authorization so that they can work and stay in the United States legally without fear of deportation or detention while they're, cooperation, while they're cooperating with the federal authorities. Unfortunately, 
In 2013, only 171 people in the entire United States got continued presence. Now, not everybody needs continued presence. A lot of trafficking victims are US citizens. Many of them are legal permanent residents. But for those who are foreign born, not giving them continued presence is horrible. What are they supposed to live on, air? Then the other problem is the government created T visas so that trafficking victims who come to the United States and cooperate with law enforcement, it's a quid pro <coughs> quo. By the way, in the State Department report, we criticize other countries for forcing victims to cooperate in order to get legal benefits and immigration benefits. But we do it ourselves, but we give ourselves an A. The T visas that are available for trafficking victims, there are 5,000 of those a year. But again, you have to cooperate. And so in 2013, the year when the most T visas were issued in the entire country, it was 848 T visas for trafficking victims in the entire United States. So what are we doing on prevention? Well, to its credit, the US government has something called the Blue Campaign. It's run out of the Department of Homeland Security. The Blue Campaign has launched a national to public relations and education campaign, you may have actually seen this poster. This is a poster against the commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking of children. And again, to their credit, they've also issued posters indicating that there is such a thing as sweatshops and forced labor in the United States. So the picture that you see of the woman is a domestic servitude picture. We have a lot of domestic servitude trafficking for forced labor in homes in the United <laughs> States. And then the young man, also very, very important because many of the trafficking victims are not female. I think we've all assumed that we're talking about women, but we're actually also talking about men and we're talking about transgender people. And so there's a huge sort of population of trafficking victims who have been invisible. So those are the three Ps. That's what the US is doing. Again, to its credit, the United States government has recently published a strategic plan. And the US government is doing much, much more of that, has spent hundreds of millions of dollars. So there is sort of quite a lot of activity going on. But when I look, and when Alex looks, at human trafficking and what justice really means for human trafficking victims, you have to go beyond the sort of superficial vision of the three Ps and ask, what is justice for trafficking victims? And from my perspective, justice for trafficking means making those victims whole, whether it's through criminal restitution or through civil judgments. And I want to talk with you today about some of the cases that we've seen and what the cases say. So one very important case that was litigated, was prosecuted in the Eastern District of New York, in Long Island, New York, was a case of a victim who wandered into a Dunkin' Donuts really early one morning. The guy was just, I think, opening up. He saw this woman, she was wearing some sort of strange flowing robe with ripped clothing underneath. He thought, you know, this isn't just a regular homeless person asking for a free cup of coffee. Something here is wrong. He called the local cops. Luckily, the local police officer who showed up to respond to the call was a police officer who had just done a roll call briefing on trafficking. And thank heavens, that roll call briefing on trafficking didn't just cover forced prostitution, didn't just cover sex trafficking, it also covered forced labor. He realized immediately and did exactly the right thing that I pray every single law enforcement officer will do. He called an NGO. The NGO managed to find an interpreter who spoke the particular uh, kind, the particular variety of uh, Indonesian that this woman spoke, and they figured out immediately that there was a second victim in the house. The victim in this case was a victim of domestic servitude. She had horrendous scarring. They couldn't figure out what it was. She had sort of half moon scars on her arms. At first, when she was in the emergency room, they thought that it was cigarette burns. Then they realized that the woman of the household punished this worker by putting her fingernails in the woman's arm until she bled. In addition, she had huge scarring behind her ears that they couldn't figure out. It turned out that the trafficking perpetrator in this particular case had tortured the victim by pulling her ears off. And every time she got angry with her, she would pull her ears off. So there was sort of scarring on top of scarring on the back of her ears. These people lived in a mansion, a multi-million dollar mansion. They could have paid a domestic worker had they chosen to. They chose not to. So the two women were taken out of the house one had held, been held for five years, the other one for two years, and both of the defendants were convicted on forced labor charges. Now, I put this picture up um, of, of Mrs. Subnani, um, not because I'm sort of supportive of the Cruella piece, but because it, 
it gives you a sense of, I think, the chutzpah that we see, uh, particularly among the forced labor defendants, which is her defense on appeal was that she could not possibly have gotten a fair trial in New York because the press coverage was so nasty and the juries were most certainly biased. Right? She didn't win. But it's reminiscent of other defenses that we've seen in other forced labor cases. For example, one case, U.S. versus Kalimlim, where the defendants went up on appeal after being prosecuted and convicted of forced labor. They went up on appeal and said, we never threatened the victim. We never told her she. We never threatened her with deportation. We just exercised our First Amendment rights and told her the truth that if she ever walked out the front door, she would be arrested, detained, and deported. It wasn't a threat. It was just the truth. Luckily, the judge who led that, that panel of the Seventh, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals realized that that wasn't actually a decent defense, the First Amendment as a defense to forced labor, so it didn't go very far. But it gives you a sense of, of what can happen in these cases. Now, what's interesting here, and the number that matters to me, is that the defendants were ordered to pay in restitution $936,000. That was remanded and it was lowered on appeal. But nevertheless, that was the initial restitution order for these two victims. So what about trafficking that you don't read about in the paper, the trafficking that we don't necessarily see? So one case is a case called U.S. versus Afalabi, which was young women from Togo, one of them as young, I think, as 11 or 10, brought to the United States and forced to braid hair 12, 14 hours a day. They did not go to school. They stayed in the hair braiding salon the entire day. They were forced to turn over all their tips and all their earnings to the traffickers. And the trafficker's son, it was a family operation, the trafficker's son actually raped one of the women as well. This was quite a sophisticated operation where people would, the Afalabi family, would find out who had won green cards in Togo, who won the green card lottery. They would go to those people and say, we will arrange your transit to the United States, and we'll take care of all of the green card lottery paperwork and administrative burden if you will just adopt this child and bring her to the United States as your child, if you will just marry this young woman fraudulently and bring her to the United States. The people who'd won the green card lottery desperate to come to the United States cooperated. They brought these girls over, they surrendered them to the alpha lobbies, and the alpha lobbies held them in forced labor. One of the things I think that we frequently believe is that only in sex trafficking do the defendants make oodles of money. The restitution order in this case, the estimates of the earnings of these traffickers was $3.9 million. So what happens in the United States in sex trafficking cases when things go right? Right. When things go right in the sex trafficking cases, and that is rare, Alex and I just finished a huge research project showing how rare that is. When things go right, cases look like U.S. versus Lewis. What matters in these cases is whether the victims have a lawyer. In all the cases I just talked about, the victims had pro bono lawyers who walked with them, holding their hand through the criminal case where the, where the perpetrators were being prosecuted as defendants. In U.S. versus Lewis, it was four little girls in Washington, D.C. Those four little girls, because of a very intelligent judge, Judge Sullivan, those four little girls ended up with a guardian ad litem, the, the equivalent of a pro bono attorney, but someone to look out for their best interests. That guardian ad litem made sure that those children got restitution. She brought in an expert. The expert calculated how much the psychiatric, psychological, and medical care would be for those girls for the next 20 years calculated how much those girls had earned for the trafficker, and I'll talk about that calculation in a minute. And the final restitution order was $3.8 million for four little girls who had been horribly exploited. It was typical of so many of the sex trafficking cases that we see of American citizens in the United States where one of the little girls was recruited straight out of the foster care system. One of the little girls was picked up at a bus station, like a bus cover when she was waiting for a bus. So tainted is our legal system that in one of the cases, Shelby Lewis, the perpetrator, managed to get legal custody and guardianship over the child. He claimed that he would be her, her foster parent. The day after he had legal authority over that child, he raped her and put her on the streets. But because these children had lawyers, that lawyer was able to 
hand the children, sort of help them through the case, and they ended up with a significant restitution order. What's interesting about U.S. law, and where U.S. law gets an A and U.S. implementation gets an F, is that restitution is mandatory in forced labor cases and in sex trafficking cases. And the calculation that I alluded to earlier is actually very interesting because the calculation in a forced labor case is easy. How many hours did the person work? What's the prevailing wage? What's the actual damage? Uh, what's the actual sort of back wages that are owed? What are the Fair Labor Standards Act liquidated damages that should be tacked on to the end? We have excellent Department of Labor wage and hour specialists who make those calculations, present them to the court, and the courts order restitution in forced labor cases. But Congress, when it was writing the law, realized that restitution for people in sex trafficking could not go along the same simple calculation. You can't say to a child who is held in forced prostitution 12 hours a day, forced to serve as clients 12 hours a day, <coughs> we're going to pay you $7.25 an hour for that. Right? doesn't work. And so what Congress decided they would do is figure out how much the trafficker earned and then force the trafficker to disgorge those assets and pay exactly that amount to the child or the trafficking victim, if the trafficking victim was an adult victim of sex trafficking. So it's the greater of the gross income. So if a trafficking victim's quota was $500 a day and she stayed with that trafficker for 100 days, you do the math because that's the number. And the beautiful thing about this, as it's been litigated and as we have more and more decisions at the Court of Appeals level, at the circuit courts, at the federal level, the courts are now saying this doesn't have to be an exact calculation. I don't know any child who actually keeps exact credit of how much money they've earned. And in fact, many of the children, as those of you who've worked in trafficking know, many of the children are paid in playing cards or paid in poker chips. They don't actually ever touch the money. So they don't know how much they've earned. It leads to there's not much funny in the human trafficking world, but every once in a while you have to find some silver humor. It does lead to absurd situations where, for example, a prosecutor in California didn't know how to calculate restitution because he didn't know how much sex acts by children cost in that particular jurisdiction. And so his boss said to him, well, just go on Craigslist and find out. He was a little wary about having that in his cookies, right? He didn't want to have, like, looking child <coughs> prostitute. And he didn't want to have that in his sort of history of web browsing. Uh, so he called the local NGO and asked the NGO to do that for, uh, for him. And, and the local NGO was able to come up with a restitution number and calculated the number and shared that with uh, with the federal prosecutor and, and the children and uh, the victims in that case got restitution. <coughs> so as I mentioned, uh, the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center together with Wilmer Hale uh, and Alex did a ton, Alex Andre uh, Levy did a ton of the sort of analytical work on this. We pulled every single federal prosecution in the United States over the last five years and we analyzed every single case over the last five years to determine whether or not there was restitution, whether mandatory actually meant mandatory in U.S. courts. And what we discovered was that trafficking victims where the defendant pleads guilty or is convicted of a crime, we only get restitution in 36% of the cases. In two-thirds of the cases, we don't get restitution. The other piece of this that I think many people don't know is that under U.S. law, trafficking victims can sue their traffickers. It does not matter. It's true under Indiana law as well. It's not just the federal system. So if the traffickers are prosecuted, and frankly, even if the traffickers aren't prosecuted, the traffickers can be forced to pay damages. Restitution orders are narrow. Restitution orders are out-of-pocket wages, whatever the trafficker earned. But a civil case is much, much broader. A civil case includes punitive damages. A civil case includes tort damages for false imprisonment and other torts that are committed and crimes are committed that are against the victims. So victims can sue. What's interesting about the civil action under federal law is that you can bring a civil action against the perpetrator, but you can also bring a civil action against whoever has financially benefited. Right? So with amendments that have happened subsequent to the initial passage in 2003, it's whoever knowingly benefited financially or receiving anything of value. So it used to be in cases where I had a domestic servitude case and I wanted to sue the perpetrators who had been convicted, but I also wanted to sue their children, their adult children who hadn't been <coughs> for continuing the trafficking when they were sentient human beings, when they were actually sort of near adult age and continuing the trafficking in their own home. 
When I sued them, I had to sue them under RICO. And those of you who've studied RICO know how hard it is to sue under RICO. Right? You have to, the, the defendants can demand in, uh, particulars. It's a, it's a higher grading standard. But now with the, with the civil litigation amendments, we can sue differently. And the victims can recover damages. And we, we just narrowly averted the circuit split on the question of whether you can get punitive damages, you can't get punitive damages. Um, Congress was very, Congress does so many things that are not smart, but it did one really smart thing, which was it allows the federal prosecutors to stay in the civil case. Right? The federal prosecutors uh, were very concerned that a civil case would completely muck up <coughs> any prosecutions that they were doing. And frankly, they're right. right? Discovery, depositions, the, the possibilities for inconsistent statements, potentially disastrous. And so what Congress said was, okay, fine, if the federal prosecutors want to stay a civil case, it's practically automatic. They can come in and stay the case during the entire prosecution. And I, as someone who represents victims of trafficking, I want there to be a federal prosecution, right? We're on the same side here, right? We want there to be a federal prosecution. And for many of my clients, that's best case scenario from their perspective. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that shall be stayed. It doesn't say the prosecutors can stay, so many of the defendants are now coming in and trying to stay our cases as well. That's all that legislative draft. <laughs> um, ten years. Victims have ten years to bring cases. It's a very long statute of limitations. The other thing that's in here is that you can get attorney's fees. Uh, I've been doing these cases for almost ten years. I've never actually, I've won fees in court, but I've actually never ever collected fees, so don't go into this for the money. It's why we train pro bono lawyers. It's why pro bono lawyers have to do these cases, because regular plaintiff's attorneys who actually do need to make money don't find these cases appealing, because generally you're trying to get as much money as you possibly can for the traffic convicted, and there's not a lot of So what's interesting about this is that you know, if I sounded a little bit critical of the federal authorities in the beginning about the small number of federal cases being brought, frankly, the private bar Pro bono attorneys and advocates for trafficking victims in the United States should be totally ashamed of ourselves because in 11 years, with this law being on the book, so we only brought 129 cases, right? 129 civil cases at the federal level. That's beyond pathetic. If you look at what the cases are brought for at the civil side, it's actually really interesting. Because if you think of it as two pyramids, with the federal prosecution pyramid with a ton of sex trafficking cases at the bottom and diminishing to forced labor cases at the top, the civil litigation pyramid is exactly the opposite, right? It's a complete reversal of that pyramid with 121, Alex made this beautiful slide, by the way, with 121 um, cases for labor trafficking for forced labor, and only eight cases for sex trafficking at the civil side. Now, I think there are a lot of reasons for this. I think one is that sex trafficking cases are just more likely to happen, right? And so when I talk to sex trafficking survivors and I say to them, we can bring a civil case, what they say to me is, I don't want to go back to court. I've already been to court. I don't want to go back. Don't make me go back. So they may not want to bring a case because they've already had a case. The second is that it, there's a lot of shame, and, and that's very sad, right? But I think it's the reality. There's a tremendous amount of shame of having been trafficked into the sex industry that doesn't really exist for somebody who's trafficked into domestic work. You know, you were a nanny, you took care of your kids, they owe you money, it's pretty straightforward. And so the domestic workers that I sue on behalf of, uh, who, who sue in these cases, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I took care of their kids. I worked 24 hours a day. The baby slept in my room. Uh, I was paid nothing, and they yelled at me and beat me. Pretty easy to make that case. Very difficult for someone who doesn't want to have their name on a complaint, right? Their name as a plaintiff on a complaint alleging all sorts of heinous acts of sex trafficking uh, where, you know, their mother could Google them, right? Their children. Google that. All the complaints are pretty much widely available on Google at this point. And so what we've managed to do, and it's a kind of growing best practice, is in cases of domestic servitude or other forced labor where we have very, very violent sexual assaults 
which are unfortunately very common in those cases. Um, where we also have sexual violence, those victims are also extremely reluctant to go forward. Or alternatively, they'll say, okay, we can sue on the forced labor, but I'm not going to sue on, let's just not mention any of that stuff. Right? Let's not put that in. So what we've been able to do across the country now in multiple circuits is convince trial judges that all of these victims should be able to proceed under a pseudonym. And so if I can sue as Jane Doe in a forced labor case where there's sexual violence, then it's probably just a little kind of baby step away for a sex trafficking victim to realize that she too can sue as Jane Doe. And we can rely on the forced labor precedent. So I'm hoping that this number will change as the Jane Doe things uh, increase. But we're, we're a long way away. So the question I started with, and, and, and Chris asked me to leave lots of time for questions, so I'm going to wrap up, so start thinking of your questions. Um, the question I asked in the beginning is, you know, is the United States a pure one country? Did we really, do we really deserve an A? Should we be giving ourselves an A? And, and I think, you know, very frequently what we see are on television are reports like this of 105 children rescued, 150 suspects arrested. You know, we see this through the Operation Cross Country um, uh, arrests that happen just about every year. It's a huge effort to recover children. There's no denying it. And they've discovered they, they've uncovered and, and recovered thousands of children. However, what happens next? What we have in the United States is a huge disconnect between what happens at the federal level and what happens at the local level. Because many of those children, not everywhere, not every state, but some of those children are then arrested locally and prosecuted for prostitution. Right? We have lots of trafficking victims across the country who have rap sheets for criminal convictions as long as your arm. We have public defenders in the United States at the local level who don't understand the dynamics of trafficking, who are telling trafficking victims in the sex industry to plead guilty and not asking, who made you do this? Why did you do this? So we ask ourselves, why so few trafficking victims come forward? <coughs> Would you come forward if really your reward for cooperation is the local juvenile hall? Right? Because the feds don't always have control over what the local prosecutors do, and there are warrants out for the arrest of people who are cooperating in federal prosecutions. The other problem that we have is this, the assumption that um, all trafficking is sex trafficking, that we can just sort of be vigilantes. I talked to a wonderful federal prosecutor who works at the Department of Justice who actually put this up on a slide. And he said, I always wondered what was wrong with American juries. And then I went to see the movie Taken, and I realized what was wrong with American juries, right? <laughs> because if you see Taken and you think that Taken is the way that trafficking works, you send your beautiful daughter to Paris on vacation and she's kidnapped by Albanian mobsters, and then you, a former CIA agent, have to go and like shoot her out. <laughs> it's really not how it works. Um, and so we have to sort of move away from the Hollywood version of trafficking and look at the American, the real life, the trench version of trafficking, which is complicated and messy and difficult. Because it's not always the sort of Liam Neeson Albanian mobster scenario. Sometimes you have trafficking in houses that look like this, right? A nice suburban street, a nice upper middle class neighborhood, and you don't know what's happening in that house. But there may be domestic servitude, there may be a child who's being held in that house. On the outside, it looks like, you know, middle America. The other thing that we don't expect, but should be thinking about, you know, for a long time we've asked ourselves, and we've tried to get hotels to cooperate with us, because we know that children are being raped in the hotel rooms, right? Children are being commercially sexually exploited in the hotel rooms. And ECPAT has done a brilliant job of getting people to sign the ECPAT challenge. They sign the, they sign the agreement that they're going to prevent that. They're going to train their staff. They're going to be sure that children are not exploited in their hotels. <coughs> but I just talked to somebody who's the head of compliance at Hilton and said, you need to actually now take step two. 
and not ask who's getting abused in those beds, but ask who's making the beds. Because in one case that was prosecuted at the federal level, a case called U.S. versus Asa Khojaev, an Uzbek man who created a labor brokering firm in the United States brought trafficked workers from all over the world and put them to work in hotels in 14 states on legal visas, I might add. They all had visas. Put them to work in hotels. Not this one. This is just an exemplar. It's not the hotel. So uh, not impugning this hotel's uh, honesty, uh, but, but held those workers in forced labor and paid them nothing or close to nothing and charged them all sorts of bogus fees for transportation, substandard housing that they had to share with 10 other occupants. Or another case that the feds did prosecute in Philadelphia, a case called U.S. versus Bostanik. And the Bostanik brothers, four Ukrainian brothers, brought workers over from Ukraine, held them in forced labor, raped and sexually abused the women, and forced them on cleaning crews where they were forced to clean Walmart and other big box, star, other big box stores on midnight shift. We have to move away from this idea that trafficking victims, <coughs> that, that trafficking victims come in illegally. Because in this particular case, once someone who came over on a J-1 visa was actually held in forced labor as a stripper at a club called Cheetahs in Detroit. <coughs> so sometimes things go right. Right, so this is a case actually that was originally brought as a trafficking case. It was pled down to something much, much less. I think actually pled down to a misdemeanor. But this is actually a case of the feds going in and raiding a <coughs> lingerie store and a bridal store with allegations that there was forced labor among the people doing the alterations on the wedding gowns and cleaning the shoes. Um, there was restitution ordered for those victims, seven victims. But my favorite part of the story, and with this I will end, um, because you can't close down a bridal shop, because people are getting married and their dresses are coming and it would be a disaster. The U.S. Marshals, to their credit, kept the store open. So the U.S. Marshals were actually selling all of the lovely <laughs> things that go <laughs> under your wedding gowns. It happened to be a woman, U.S. Marshal, on duty this day, but it could, men, U.S. Marshals, were also running the bridal shop. So I thought that was like really kind of going, going with Long haul. That was good. <laughs> All right, so, so questions. So I think to finish, to, to, to wrap up, my, in the final analysis, do we deserve an A? No, we don't. Do we deserve a B? Maybe with some great inflation. I think right now, partly because of this disconnect between state and federal authorities, we're getting a C minus, right? And we really need to do better. So that's where I am. Feel free to disagree with me. Maybe you think we're getting an A plus, and I'd love to hear your I'd love to hear your reasoning for that. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions as well. Any questions? <coughs> Someone has to be first. Yes, please. I'm interested that you describe ten years as a long statute of limitations. If you're a child or a teenager, mm -hmm. ten years doesn't seem that long to me. Okay. To um, to find a way to inform people about the crime and then go through the process. So could you say a little bit about that judgment that 10 years is a good one? You know, that's a really interesting question. <coughs> and I'm doing it because I'm comparing it to the statute of limitations under the Fair Labor Standards Act, for example, which is two years, or three years in case of a willful violation. I'm comparing it to the statute of limitations for something like false imprisonment, which in some states is as short as one year. So I'm comparing it to, I think, a different cohort of cases than you are the comparison that you made is more comparison to child sexual abuse statutes. And those have been extended, those have been lengthened. What I would do if I had a case of a child trafficking victim who couldn't come forward for whatever reason until 12 years after, is I would argue that there was tolling. Right? So we would try and toll the statute of limitations as much as we possibly could. And we have some success doing this, you know, arguing that someone couldn't possibly have sued because they were traumatized. So we can, we can, I think, uh, if we're clever, we can sometimes extend the statute of limitations a little bit if we have good arguments on them. But for, for adults, 10 years is pretty generous based on the other sort of choices that we have mm -hmm. under, with the other statutes. But yes, please. I was wondering, uh, with the restitution orders, how successful um, has it been of actually getting the money to the victims? And how long has that process been? That is such a brilliant question. You like hit the because that's sort of phase two of the research. 
Getting a restitution order is not enough, right? In some ways, there's nothing worse than waiting a million dollars and never getting it, right? So this is another reason why the trafficking victims need pro bono attorneys, right? Because the federal prosecutors are fabulous, particularly when they get the restitution orders, but they have to move on to the other 12 cases that they are simultaneously prosecuting. And so it's very hard for them. They're not going to devote a ton of time, because they can't, to trying to actually collect the money. And so what I try and do, if I possibly can, is work with the federal prosecutor, particularly in a plea deal, so that the plea agreement includes restitution prepayment. I love prepayment. Right, because the only time you really have the defendant over a barrel is before their sentence, not after. And so in one really brilliant case, a case called U.S. versus Bacalana, a case in the Eastern District of Virginia, the defendant was investigated for trafficking, allowed to plead guilty to two counts of lying to the FBI, right, not exactly a, there's not exactly a victim in that, I mean, the FBI is probably the victim, but nevertheless, in the Eastern District of Virginia, this awesome prosecutor managed to get full back wages, $41,000 in back wages, for the domestic worker who was the victim of that crime <coughs> and managed to get it prepaid. So the victim's attorney opened an escrow account. The defendant was required to transfer the money into the escrow account. The pro bono attorney confirmed with the judge, having the judge bring him up, in the Eastern District of Virginia, confirmed with the judge that the, that the money had been received and then the sentencing could go forward. Right. So prepayment is the best option. The second best option, if you have a conviction, um, if you have a conviction and uh, the probation officers always do a report, you have, to, you have to sort of admit to whatever assets you own. Right? You have to admit to what you have. And so the defendants swear out an affidavit of all of their property. Then that's eventually, after the restitution order comes into play, that's given to what's called the financial litigation unit. Every U.S. attorney's office has a financial litigation unit. Some of them are great and some of them are less great. They have a pile this high of restitution orders that they have to enforce in you know a whole slew of cases, not just trafficking cases. So what I try to do is call, figure out which lawyer of the financial litigation unit is in charge. And then I call them and I say, look, this is a really important case. Could you please prioritize this? And you know, nine times out of 10, the financial litigation unit, civil lawyer, also agrees that it's a really important case, right? They've read about it in the paper. They want to enforce it as well. Um, it, it's very hard <coughs> sometimes that, you know, in the forced labor cases, not only are the victims more likely to get restitution, they're actually more likely to see it. Because the forced labor perpetrators are homeowners <coughs> with cars, houses, you know, stuff. And the federal government can force them to liquidate all of that. The other great thing about restitution orders that I love, 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 is that for traffickers who are living on the grid, and many of them don't, many of them live off the grid, but for those of them who are living on the grid who pay into the social security system, a good prosecutor can put a red flag on that defendant's social security number, and then when that defendant starts collecting any federal benefits whatsoever, some of it is withheld and sent to the trafficking victim. So it's possible actually to get restitution decades after it's ordered through this sort of withholding piece. Prosecutors can also put a hold on prisoners' prison accounts. So when the trafficker is in prison and his buddies transfer money for cigarettes, some of that money is then transferred out again to the trafficking victim. My favorite, however, is um, the most difficult situation where the federal government comes in and forfeits all the assets. Right? So they go in, they raid a brothel, they forfeit the $500,000 that's hidden in the mattress. And a, a good prosecutor, and there are many of them, but a, a good federal prosecutor will sort of put that money in abeyance and say, okay, we're holding this for a, we're, we're holding this for the, for the restitution. Sometimes defendants will also, in the Sabnani case, for example, the defendants put up a bond, they put up, I think, their $2.9 million apartment, and so that was held. <coughs> but when the assets are seized, we've had some bad cases in some states where the forfeited assets are then forfeited to the federal government, to the Treasury. And then the pro bono lawyers <coughs> spend the next two years trying to claw the money back. It's really it can be very, very difficult. So what we need to do is to front load this, right? Front load it in thinking a restitution request has to go in. A restitution order must be made. And then we need to be thinking way in advance of how it's going to be paid. 
one of the things I hear frequently in, in people who don't want to do civil cases, um, or who are critical of the idea of doing civil cases, they will say, and I hear this from I hear this from defense, I, I, I'm sorry, I hear this from prosecutors as well sometimes. Well, the defendant has no money, so why are we going to bother to have a restitution order? Like, why waste all that energy getting a restitution order? They've got nothing. They have no money. And the story I love to tell is this wonderful story about an organization called the Center for uh, Justice and Accountability, which is a wonderful organization in California, CJA, that sues human rights violators. <coughs> so it sues uh, people who commit torture in another country and then come to the United States. There was a case that CJA did against a Haitian member of the Secret Place, someone who was a member of the Tantan Makut, who had tortured a number of people. He ended up in the United States in Florida as a, an asylum. An asylee. I uh, got refugee status in the United States. His victims also ended up in the United States, right? And uh, they sued him and got a multi million dollar judgment. He was, of course, judgment proof, declared bankruptcy. And then years later, one of the victims was actually watching TV in Florida, and he had won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> so CJ like, immediately swooped in and seized all the assets. Now, I'm not saying that traffickers are going to win the lottery. What I am saying is you never know. Right, so if I kill the restitution order, why, why decide not to do the civil case just because there's no money at the end of the rainbow? Again, this is another reason pro bono attorneys have to do the cases, right? A lawyer who knows that somebody's judgment proof and has no assets is not going to do the case if they're hoping to get paid a third at the end. Whereas pro bono attorneys who are doing it for nothing don't need to get paid at the end. So that's the long term, <coughs> but it's a really, really important, it's a really important issue. Very, very uh, I know you touched on it briefly, but what do you think the best course of action is for breach, uh, for sort of breaching the gap between federal and state level criminalization of trafficking victims? Right. That's a really hard question. I don't know. I don't actually know the right answer to that. I think what we're seeing across the country is a, a, a growing sort of change in the mindset of the state legislatures and a growing. Uh, willingness to create safe harbor statutes, right? And so there are now, I think, 17 states in the United States that have passed laws so that if you are a trafficking victim and you are uh, arrested for prostitution by the local authorities, you can go to a diversion court. <coughs> and so you, you are given services rather than prison time. What the activists who work on this much more than I do in New York uh, what the activists in New York say is the problem, the central problem, is that you're still in the criminal justice system, right? And so we were talking about this at an ICAP meeting earlier. If the funnel is into the criminal justice program and the place you're going is into a diversion program, if you violate the terms of your diversion, you're right back in the criminal justice program. That's not an answer, right? Because teenagers, if anybody has any, you know, they don't really follow the rules. <laughs> Um, and there's a real reluctance to put kids in lockdown, right? In lockdown shelters where you, know, you don't follow the rules and you're in trouble. So this part is really hard. I think it's a matter of sort of educating the local authorities and educating the local, the, the local <coughs> police. The efforts I think that have been most successful in the United States um, are, are efforts where there's been a sort of collaborative work between the judges and the diversion court and, and the advocates. So people like Kate Mogulescu, who's legendary, <coughs> and who works for legal aid in New York, um, who, who's really trying to sort of steer people out of the out of the criminal justice system. The irony, though, is that's where the money is, right? The money has not been put into social services or treatment services for children, which makes more sense. The money's been put in the criminal justice system. But I think that's I think that's sad. That's that part's bad. So that's a work in, that's a work in progress. But the other thing is, I think we need to look abroad. Because other countries do this stuff better, right? I think we need to admit that, like, when, while we may be getting a C minus, other countries actually deserve the aid that the State Department gave them. So one of my favorite countries is the Netherlands, and that's not just because I'm Dutch. Um, but, but in the Netherlands, if a, if a prosecutor, for example, gets a restitution order against a defendant, the government of the Netherlands has six months to collect the money. And if they don't collect the money, then the government of the Netherlands has to pay the victim. And then they spend the rest of their lives, rather than the rest of the victim's life, trying to collect the money. So when I, when I heard that at a conference in, in the Netherlands, I was so excited. I came back to the United States and I called my friends at the Department of Justice. I said, what a great idea. 
And they said, no, when hell freezes over, it does not <laughs> go, go back to Europe. Um, but, there, but there are indeed, I think, other, other countries that are, that are working on this, and, and places where sort of children and victims are, are treated as victims. Ironically, Kate Mugalesco and another, a number of other advocates from the United States just went to a UN meeting in Geneva and denounced the criminalization of trafficking victims. So they actually have a kind of declaration from the Human Rights Council of the UN saying that trafficking victims shouldn't be criminalized in any country, not just in the United States. So, yes, please. Um, in my limited experience in this case, actually, I think it's the cheetah's case that you. I'm sorry, which one? The cheetah's case. Uh -huh. That sounds like the facts. Um, you were in Michigan? I was here, it was here, but she moved to Michigan. Yeah. yeah. Um, one interesting thing that we didn't expect in that case was an immigration problem in that we had gotten to the point in the visa process where uh, our clients could naturalize, become U.S. citizens, and they absolutely did not want to do so. Um, they wanted to return to their home country. They thought it was like insult upon injury to have to stay, because they had come to, to study abroad, not to immigrate to the United States. Right. Um, and they were unable to do so because though the traffickers were imprisoned, um, relatives, new relatives, and there were threats about violence to them or family if they returned to their home country. And so I'm wondering if um, if you run into similar situations in terms of um, permanent immigration for the clients, but also how you handle this, uh, things in the, the country of origin for foreign nationals. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So my problem is actually different than that. I have clients who are in T visa status and they want to go home and see their dying mother, their child, whatever it is. But they're in T visa status, and they can't leave, right? Because if you leave the United States while you're in T visa status, then you can't, or it's very, very difficult to adjust your status to LPR. So I find myself constantly saying to clients, you can't go home yet, or please don't. It's very hard to get you advanced parole, um, and I can't guarantee that I can get you back in. Uh, so you please wait. Right. Please wait until we adjust your status to, to green card. Once they're in green card status, they can travel anywhere except where there are these sort of witness protection problems. And, you know, it's, that one's a really, that one's really difficult. Uh, Denise Brennan, who's a professor of anthropology at Georgetown, has written a really excellent book recently uh, called Life Interrupted about what happens to people with T visas because it's not what you expect. It's not that you have a T visa and then you live the American dream, right? It's not all fabulous, right? When you get a T visa, frequently you still don't speak English. You still may not have more than a third grade education. You may still be illiterate, um, you know, or you may have a PhD, but it's very, very difficult in this environment to find a job in the United States and suddenly live the American dream. So being an immigrant in the United States is enormously difficult, and I can completely understand why people would want to go home um, and how hard it would be if it's impossible. I mean, they're basically in the same situation as refugees, right? They, because of the sort of danger factor. So on a question like that, I would actually refer it to the people who are used to dealing with sort of refugee issues, because that's a question that more frequently comes up in that context than in mine. In my context, like the happiest days of my, I have many happy days. I'm an unusual lawyer that way. I have many happy days. <laughs> my happy days are when IOM, the International Organization for Migration, reunites family members. So once we get someone a T visa, we can get derivative visas for their children and their spouse, and in some cases their parents, depending on the age. What I love is like going to the airport and watching these people who haven't seen each other for seven, for seven years, like fall into each other's arms. Everybody at the airport is fine. So it, it's hardly about like family reunification. I'm usually there as a photographer. <laughs> Um, so those are incredibly happy days. When we win a million dollar judgment in a civil case for a victim, those are unbelievably happy days. When we get a restitution order and a conviction and, and prison time for a perpetrator, those are unbelievably happy days. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough of those. Right? I want more happy days. I don't want a happy day once in a quarter. Right? I want more happy days. Um, and I think we will have more good results when every single trafficking victim in the United States has a lawyer. The other answer to your question is that we have a lot of problems, and, and we're trying now not just to build up a US network of pro bono attorneys. We're trying to build up an international network of pro bono attorneys. 
because the traffickers are becoming increasingly vicious and increasingly sophisticated. And so now when I bring a lawsuit against a trafficker in the United States, or even when there's a criminal prosecution, the traffickers will frequently bring bogus criminal charges against my client in the country of origin and try and get her prosecuted in the country of origin, oftentimes for crimes they committed. Right? She falsified her passport application. Oh, interesting, because she's totally illiterate and can't write, and somebody wrote it for her, and I think it was you. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, they try to get the victim prosecuted for that. Or they'll file a bogus civil suit against members of the family of the victim. So we have to then find lawyers in all of those countries. In restitution cases, we also have to find lawyers in those countries who will, um, great find lawyers in those countries who will enforce the restitution orders abroad and civil sessions abroad. So I'm hoping ultimately that we'll have an international network for our lawyers who can deal with some problems like that as well. We may have time for one very quick last question. If not, thank you so much for coming. I'll stay after if anybody wants to come up and ask me questions directly.